Man, what a great time we've had this morning already. Amen. I pray that God's word will continue to be manifested through through what I'm about to share. It's time for our kids uh, to be able to go to children's church. So uh, have our kids uh, up to sixth grade. If y'all will come on down and uh, they're over here waiting on you and then you're going to have a great time this morning t- learning about Jesus upstairs in the children's time. So uh, I know you'll have a good time there and uh, parents, remember that we'll be picking, you'll be picking up your kids out at, uh, uh-oh, my batteries are going low, huh? For my microphone, but not for me, amen? My battery's pumped. I'm ready to go, amen? So uh, while they're leaving out, give me just one second. Good? Can you hear me now? All right. Can you at home hear me? Well, just, just nod. You'll be all right. <laughs> hey, today we're going to continue on with urgent, urgent service. It is time for the church to get serious. It is time for us to understand the impact that we are to have on, on the world. Because, my friends, Jesus is coming again. Amen. I shared with you the last few weeks about that, and today we're going to continue on with that thought and looking at the idea of Jesus telling us that we don't know the time that he's coming back, but the fact is that he is coming. Now, he didn't give us the date and the time. As a matter of fact, there's been a lot of times that people will try to predict when Jesus is coming back. I shared in the first service that I remember in the 90s especially, there was a trend of people trying to write books on finding out when Jesus was coming again. And what they would do is they'd say, we've read the first three chapters of this book and taken the third letter from the fourth word all the way down in the sixth paragraph. And by putting numerical value on each one of those, we have determined that Jesus Christ is going to come back on this such and such date. Well, guess what? He didn't come back on that such and such date. Amen? You know why? Because Jesus has already told us, we're going to look at it here in just a few moments, Jesus has clearly told us not one single individual on this earth knows when he's coming back. Not even the angels know when he's coming back. Only God the Father knows. And when he is ready, when it has reached the time that he will then say, Jesus, go and receive my people back to me. So we can do all the mathematical things and look at different phrases and different words and add numerical values to all this stuff, but we will never figure out when Jesus is coming again. Now, what Jesus did say, though, was there will be a time that you can recognize I'm going to tell you about a season that you'll be able to see that time is getting close. And that's what we're going to look at today. Because my friends, listen to me. I believe with all my heart, we are living in that season that we're about to read. And we're going to talk about why here in just a few moments. But I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, starting at verse 36. And we'll be reading through verse 44. And we're going to be seeing again the idea of an indication of what it will be like before Jesus comes back. So let's go ahead and, if you can, stand in honor of reading God's Word this morning. Matthew 24, starting at verse 36. Jesus says here, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men shall be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what the hour your Lord is coming. But know, that, know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. 
Therefore, you also may be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for just the, the great time of praise and worship we've experienced. And Father, I pray now that as I share this message, that Lord, the, the words I'm going to say will not be my words, but they'll be your words. I pray, Father, that this is not a message that I came up with, but, but God, one that you breathed into me. And that, Father, I pray the response, and, and I know you're going to be calling for a response at the end of this service. I pray it will be pleasing to you and as you desire it to be. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. So we don't know the hour, we don't know the exact time, but Jesus here, listen, he doesn't want us to be unaware. He wants us to know, he wants us to, to be able to say, okay, I believe this is getting close. Because he wants us, can I tell you, Jesus wants the world to be ready for his return. There's not one person that Jesus has gotten in his mind thinking, you know what, I hope so-and-so isn't ready. But his desire is for every person. Because the Bible says God's desire is for all men to be saved. Amen? And so he wants people to be ready. So he says, I, I, it will come at a time that you don't expect, but I don't want you to be ignorant of it. So what he did was he gave us this time. And the time that we're going to be looking at should create in us a desire to be ready. And it would seem that today people have seemingly no desire for the things of God. And they're quite content to just let things be the way they are. Just let it go. We'll manage it somehow. Not having the thought in their mind that Jesus is coming again. But can I tell you, the thing that we have to be worried about the thing that we have to be careful in the church is I believe that the church can also slip into this mentality. That we're going to be thinking, look, they haven't been, they've been preaching Jesus coming back for a long time. He hasn't come. And so he's warning the church here, you also be ready. And by doing so, by being ready, then your goal is to Try to get other people ready. That's what this whole idea of September Outreach Explosion has been about. To get us to understand that it's our job to go out and to, to try to bring people to Jesus. And, and I've been excited about all the things that I've been hearing with the Outreach Explosion. And my, my desire is that this doesn't end in sept at the end of September, which is coming up very quickly. Amen but that we would continue striving to do things that are going to allow us an opportunity to go and, and bring people and make a connection to them so that they would have an opportunity to see Jesus in us and then have an opportunity that then they would be ready for this time that we don't know. But we can see that the world is getting to that point. And what he told us is that the clear picture of the state of the world will be as it was in the days of Noah. I shared in the first service this morning, I remember, gosh, it's been, I don't even remember how long ago, Martha, I preached my very first sermon. That God had called me, not, I, I, I thought he was going to call me into the preaching ministry where I could still teach and coach and on the side go out and preach every now and then and so I surrendered over to the preaching ministry and and I remember my first sermon I remember it clearly and no one else will remember it I'm sure but I do but I remember preaching and it was on Noah and it was on Noah and the ark. And, and my whole premise to this was, is the idea that the world had no idea what was about to happen to them. Noah had been told, get on the ark, take all the animals. And then the Bible, and I remember clearly stating this, and I, it, it just, I still hang on this, the idea. The Bible says that when they got in, God closed the door. You understand that Noah didn't close the door. Noah had no control of the door. But God, the Bible says, closed it when he was ready. And so I, I remember thinking about those people. And I remember preaching and thinking about what must it have been like when that door closed. And they began to look and see that things were changing. That stuff they had watched for 100 years was now beginning to take place. And I remember thinking even that clearly years ago that when it began to rain, that initially the people might have even responded in a way of going, 
wow, this isn't so bad. We've never had rain before. You know, that, that water coming from the sky, whoo, kind of feels good. It relieves me a little bit. It's been kind of warm here this season, but now it feels kind of good. Not realizing that the very thing they were enjoying now was going to bring death to them. And I began to think about this right here, and I remember even on that sermon was thinking about in the world, the world now is having no thought about Jesus coming back. Again, as a matter of fact, they're even thinking about this stuff of being of God is crazy. And they're beginning to enjoy the things of this world, not realizing that the things they're enjoying, the things they're craving, the things they think is bringing pleasure to them is actually going to be that thing that causes them to die spiritually. So we see Jesus is trying to get us to understand there is going to be a season that you can see. There's going to be a time that we in the church should be able to stop and go, hmm, this could be soon. Jesus could be coming again. So what was it like when he says it was like it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns? What would it be like? It would be like the idea of the world was being a corrupt and violent place. The Bible says in the book of, of Genesis chapter 6, then the Lord saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. So when God looked out, the world was a violent, corrupt place. And the Bible says it even caused God to regret that he even made the earth. And he said, I will destroy this and I will save Noah and his, his family because he is a righteous man. But the world was going, we have no idea what's going on, but it was a wicked place. They didn't want anything to do with God. As a matter of fact, they were, the Bible says that they were even trying to create in their mind ways to be more evil. They were looking for opportunities. In other words, what they were doing was they were taking that which was good and saying that's evil now. Don't do that. that that's hard. That's, that's cold. You can't be that way. And then they were taking that which was evil and making it good and making it normal and making it where if you don't participate in this, if you don't celebrate this evil, then you're not right. You don't understand. And that's what it was like. My friends, can I tell you today, that's where we're living now. That's where we're living in our world today is that we are considering that evil is now good. And if you don't participate in the evil, you're bad. You don't get it. You're, you're mean and you're cold and, and you, you're a hater. If you don't participate in what we're ordaining and we're legalizing it to be right, we're even celebrating the fact that it's evil. But we're calling it good. And if you don't agree with us, you're the bad person. Folks, we're living in those days right now. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, uh, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of, of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. So in here we are being described to us what the world is going to be like. And my friends, listen to me. If you were like me, everything you heard you could just check off and say, yep, 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 all the way down through there. And it even says despisers of good, hating that which is good, hating that which is of God because God is good and only God is good. So they despise God. My friends, can I tell you, we're living in that world today right now. God is despised in our world. And I hear a lot of people say, well, you're just gauging that off of what's happening in America. What gives you the right to think that, that America is the center of all the stuff and that whatever happens in America, that determines what happens in the world and then that determines what God's coming, that God's coming back? 
My response to that is, is that I believe, and, and you look around the world, America is the last bastion of freedom and religious expression. We were, as a matter of fact, we were made up for that very reason of freedom of religion, being able to express ourselves and, and do the things that God wants, that Judeo-Christian mentality. And you say, well, why, what about around the world? Well, you look around the world, my friends, and you look at Europe. Europe is now called a dark continent. Not because they don't have electricity, but in Europe now they used to have, they have cathedrals where people used to fill the place up. All over Europe. My daughter lives there now, working there. And she has told me, so dad, this is one of the most dark areas I've ever seen. Now they have all the modern stuff. They're enjoying life. So, but there is absolutely no desire for God. And all of the great, great cathedrals, they're empty. No one's going anymore. They don't want any part of it. So we can't depend on those, th that continent. So God, I believe, has raised up our, our great nation to be an influencer. Now, I think we're beginning to lose some of that. And when America is gone and our, we're turned into this, folks, who's left? Who out there is left to do what God has called our nation to do that we've been doing now for over 200 years? So yes, we can look and say, what goes on here is a determinant of what's already happened around the world. It's already gone on there. They have already become dark. So he says, in these last days, we are going to experience this worldwide, that God will be despised. And can I tell you again, my friends, around the world and even in our nation today, Jehovah God, Jesus Christ, is being mocked and despised. Even in our place, even in America, people are despising God. So we see the world will be corrupt and violent because there will be no, no light that's going to be shining. And then what else would it be like? The world would have no concern for what's happening. We see here that in the days of Noah, they were so consumed with their own lives and their own selfish desires. The Bible says that they were, uh, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. So we say, well, what is wrong with that? It's nothing wrong with living. There's nothing wrong with planning. There's nothing wrong with wanting to enjoy the life. But what's going to happen in those days and what's going to happen in our day is that will be all that we think about. We'll only think about the things that I have to do, the things that I want to do. The idea and the thoughts of God will be secondary to everything else. Even in the church, as I said, we have to be careful because we in the church can get just like that, where even church is secondary in our lives, that we'll go to church if we have time. We'll be in Bible study if there's nothing else going on. We will schedule a whole lot of stuff, and if I have time, we will insert God in there when we can. And you say, preacher, that's getting kind of harsh. It's the fact. Amen? That's why churches aren't full every Sunday. Because we have so much more stuff to do. We've got preacher. I've got life to live. Don't you understand? Oh, I do. I do. But I also understand that Jesus warned us this will be the way it's going to be when he returns. That we're so consumed with, with our lives and our own selfish desires. Where any mention of the things of God seemed foolish. Now can you imagine, think back. You know the story of, of Noah and whenever God told him to build the ark. And he told his family and they got it together and they began to build the ark. Well, you got to remember, whenever Noah began to build that ark, people began to take notice of him. Now, when he began to do it, not everybody, no, people didn't come up to him and go, Woo, we are so proud of you for taking a stand. We are so proud of you to do something that no one else has ever done. You're building an ark in the middle of a desert, and you're saying that God is going to send a flood in a place that we don't, we don't know what rain is. We don't know what a flood is. We've never seen any of this. Boy, you're great, Noah. Keep doing it. We're going to support you. As a matter of fact, we're going to come and help you. 
Hey, none of that happened, amen? For a hundred years, he was building on that ark, and the whole time he was being despised and mocked and rejected, and people were coming to him and said, you've been building on that ark for 25 years, nothing happened yet. Later on, they come and said, hey, you've been building this ark for 50 years. Still, nothing. Are you crazy? And I would dare say the longer he went, the less people really wanted to have anything to do with him. To where it finally came to a point, I bet many of them were so angry and so upset, they said, Noah, we're going to have nothing to do with you. You are crazy. We're not selling you anything. You can't buy anything from us. We're not trading with you. We want nothing to do with you. Because this seems foolish of what you're saying. Sound familiar? Because we were told in 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, for the message of the cross is what? Foolishness. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The very ones who need the message are calling out today saying everything you're saying is foolish. That we need Jesus in our lives. We need a man who died on the cross, who was buried in a tomb, who three days later was resurrected, who ascended to heaven, and now is coming back. You're saying we need that? That is absolute foolishness. As a matter of fact, if you keep acting that way, and if you keep saying stuff like that, We're not going to have anything to do with you because you hate people. You hate people for doing that. You don't don't love people. You say you love people, but if you tell somebody that they're going to hell because of of not receiving this Jesus, that's, that's foolishness. I think we're there, folks. Where the cross and what I'm preaching is foolishness. As a matter of fact, There are churches today who are taking this foolishness and wiping it away and saying, okay, 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 we we agree, we uh, we see what you're saying. We'll tone it down a little bit. We'll begin to say, you know what, that is foolishness. We'll begin to bring in whatever you feel good with. We'll preach a softened down gospel so that you will like us. Because we don't want to act foolish. We don't want you turning away from us. If you turn away from us, us, How can we give you the message? So we'll take the foolishness away. My friends, listen to me. When we take away the foolishness of the cross, listen, when we take away the foolishness of the cross, we're taking away the truth of their salvation. Take away the foolishness of the ark, and you took away their salvation. So as it was in the days of Noah, people will be not concerned about what's going on. They'll think it's all foolishness, and you've been talking, and you've been preaching this for so long. Now we don't want anything to do with you. You need to just stop. The world has no concern for what's happening. But listen, third part of this that I want to see in this text, Noah was fully aware. Man, he knew. He was convinced That this was the thing to do. I must prepare this ark. I must, no matter how much people laugh at me. I must, no matter how much I'm rejected. I must, no matter how much I'm called a hater. I must, no matter how much it looks like I'm turning away from people. I must do this because I am aware the flood is coming. My friends, he was aware. You know why? Because God had clearly told him the time was coming. He told him that. God clearly said in Genesis 6, 13, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and I, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Hey, he told, he was told, amen. God looked at him and said, Noah, build the ark because I will destroy the earth. I will. So he clearly understood. He clearly knew. But can I tell you to add to that part? We clearly know the truth as well. You know how? God, like he told Noah, listen, God has told us. In his word, he says, 
I am coming again. Remember last week's sermon? I hope you remember it a little bit, but maybe if I say this, you'll remember it. Go, oh, yeah. The, the, G, Jesus had ascended to heaven, and the, the disciples were standing there. The apostles were looking up, and the angel said, hey, why are you looking up there into heaven? Because this same Jesus whom you just saw ascend, he what? Will come again in like manner. Jesus, just before that in the book of Matthew, said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, what? I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you will be also. We see in the book of Revelation, I talked last week, three times, he says, Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Absolutely, surely, I am coming quickly. So, friends, can I tell you today, All of us have been told over and over and over, not just by preachers, not just by teachers, but we have been told by God himself over and over and over in his word, he is coming again. And when he comes, those who do not know him will be rejected. But those who know him will be taken. Listen, we know We know that. Just as Noah was convinced, my friends, we have been told. We can't look around and go, well, I'm not sure. What makes you not sure? He's here. He tells us. Be ready. This text lets us know that we can't know the exact time for Jesus to come, but that he's coming. And now listen. Listen. Since none of us here and none of you at home know when he's coming, you know what that means? We better watch. We better watch and be ready. We must watch for ourselves. We must watch and make sure that our lives are pleasing to him. But we must be ready. And what that means is clear the path for anyone else to come to Jesus. We must be ready. We must know that he's coming and do whatever we can as individuals, whatever we can do as a church to bring people to Jesus. Why? Because we know that he's coming again. We know it. We've been told. We know then that Noah was ready. Amen? Noah was ready. He went in, his family went in, and then the Bible says... At God's timing, he closed the door. At God's timing, he is coming again. Nothing we can do to control it. We can't make it happen. We can't keep it from happening. When God's ready, he will close the door. Now, the thing that we must understand is by being ready in this whole text... We need to be careful because I know our focus on this text should not be on the time, but on the fact. Since we don't know the time, I think we work so hard trying to figure out, well, what day will it be? But my friend, that's not, what, that's not even what Jesus is trying to get them to understand in this text. The, what he's getting them to understand is the fact. I'm, I'm coming again. You need to understand that. I'm coming again. So when we know that, We can get so focused on the prophecy that we miss what it really means. So what was the emphasis of the text? I want to wrap it up right here very quickly. The first thing that that, that he wants us to understand, he wants us to emphasize is, is the fact Jesus is coming again. Don't worry about when. You need to know that he is. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, he's coming again. The second thing we need to understand from this text is that, my friends, there are people that are lost. There may be some here in this room that you may have never received Jesus in your life. You may be at home and you never received Jesus in your, as a Savior of your life. You might have done a lot of good stuff. You might have been trying to work hard. You might have been baptized. You might be a church, member of a church. You might have all this stuff, but you never had a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But there are people in this world that are lost, people that you come in contact with every day, some that you students may go to school with. They're lost. Some people you work with every day, they're lost. People you come in contact with, they're lost. The emphasis here is Jesus is coming again and there are people that are lost. 
So we need to understand that. The third one is that we know what's needed. We've been told. Amen? We know what's needed. What is needed for a person to have a relationship with God? What is needed for a person to get to heaven? Jesus. That's it. Nothing more. Oh, but listen, nothing less. Nothing more, but nothing less. It is Jesus. We know that. And because we know it, we should be watching our lives and we should be clearing the path for others to get there because we must share the word. That's what, hey, if you get anything from this text, these are the, these are the four things you really, man, you, you've got to grasp hold of right here. Jesus is coming. There are people that are lost. We know the answer, and we got to share it. That's our call. Amen? That's our call. But sometimes I think we get, as I mentioned to you, we sometimes get so wrapped up in the other stuff, we get even so wrapped up in the world. I want to close with this, this question as I shared in the first service, that during my time of planning these sermons for weeks and, and putting them all together, I, I came across as I was reading this question, and the question was this. If you could push a button that would make it possible for Jesus to come right now, I mean right now, you, you had that. Here, G, there's a button, you push it, and Jesus comes again. Would you push it? Now, here's the thing. I had to confess and I had to repent before God right there, and I'm now publicly telling you, I kind of struggled with that. And I know others, you may be struggling with that. Well, I don't know, because we'd say, I don't know if I would push it right now, because you know what? I, I want to see my kids grow up. I don't know if I'd push it now, because... I want to have grandkids. I want to experience that. I don't know if I'd push it right now because I want a career. I, want, I don't know if I'd push it now because I want to get married and I want to have kids. I don't know if I'd push it now because I want to get through high school and go to college. I want to, I want to push it now. I, I don't want to push it now. When I do all of that and I get through all of that, then I would push that button and say, Jesus, you can come again. Can I tell you that if you are hesitant to push that button for any of those reasons, you might be focused on the stuff of this world, living life, eating, drinking, giving in marriage, being married, more than you are about Jesus. You say, now preacher, that's, that's kind of cold stuff right there. What should be our desire as a Christian? Behold, I'm coming quickly. And you remember in the book of Revelation, behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Surely I come quickly. Do you remember right after that, you remember what John said? Even so, Lord, come. I am so ready for you to come. Come, Lord Jesus. Take me away because being with you is far greater than anything this world has to offer. I give everything. I would give everything everything in this world so that I could be with you. But as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. The people will be so wrapped up in life and wanting life, longing for life, willing to trade life for that. Then the coming of the Son of Man will take place. Are you ready for Jesus to come? I can't give that answer to you. Now, I, I told you I had to repent in my office because that's in a chill down my, in my heart and down my body. When I read that, would you push the button right now? My answer was, ooh, I might. Mm. When I did that, I went, Lord, forgive me. Mm. Forgive me. Now, I could have come up with one of those church rehearsals and said, no, I'm not ready to give it to push that button because I know people don't know Jesus. But can I tell you, that wasn't my first thought. I would have been very proud if that would have been my first thought. 
Oh, not today, Lord, because I, I know someone and I'm praying for them and I want them to come to know you. But you know what? That wasn't my first thought. My first thought was, well, I got a little more life to live. You don't think that kicked me in the head? And I went right back to that verse. And in that days, they will be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, more consumed about life than they are about Jesus. Right there, I said, Lord, I want to be like John. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. But as long as I'm here, let me clear the path for others to come to know you. Jesus is coming again. I'm going to ask Patrick to come on back up. As, and I shared with you at the beginning, man, there's going to be a moment of, of response for you, for you at home as well. A moment of response. And that moment is now. That moment is here. You've had a great time of worship. You've heard the message. Now I ask you, are you ready for Jesus to come again? In other words, do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Has there been something else that you've been holding on to so tightly that you just can't let go of it? My friends, I want to pray for you today that you would release that and you would surrender over to Jesus. The answer to all of the, that we have, Jesus is our answer today. Jesus is the fulfillment of all that we need. He, it is in him. Would you surrender to him today? Maybe if you're here and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved, but I don't know that I've been clearing any paths because I've been so consumed by my own life, my own desires. I've even thought when you ask that question that I wouldn't be ready because I want this more than I want Jesus to come back. But my friends, that can't be in our hearts. You know why? Because if that's in our hearts, we're not really going after people with everything we got. Because we think we got more time. We need to go today like Jesus could come tomorrow. Would you do that? Would you pray for our church, that our church would be so consumed with bringing people to Jesus, that we'd be willing to do whatever it takes to bring one more person to Christ? That's what we ought to be after. Amen? Why? Because Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if God's speaking to your heart today, you at home, would you just call upon his name this morning? Say, God, stir my heart for whatever you need from me. I surrender to you. I surrender to you. Father, hear our prayer today. Hear our prayer. If you need Christ, I'll be here ready for you. If you're at home, you can call the church. Man, we want to lead you to Jesus more than we want anything else. We want you to know Jesus. If you're here today, I want you to know Jesus. Father, hear us. Be pleased with our response in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to stand. 